Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, no matter where, where you are in the, the world. Welcome to another Engine Global Roundtable series. I'm Fred Walty. I'm the CEO of the Network for Global Innovation. And in partnership with the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, we bring discussions, periodically we bring discussions on what we think are important topics, the world of climate, climate technology, clean tech, entrepreneurs involved in that, policy surrounding that. Uh, if there are uh, two things that describe our uh, roundtables, it would be, first of all, we try to bring a global perspective to it. Uh, Engine has a footprint in 24 countries in our previous roundtables as well as today. We, we have uh, participants from a number of different countries, as well as the audience will probably be for more than a dozen, sometimes two dozen different countries. And the second part of what we try to do is we try to focus on the practical bent, if you will. Uh, many of us are, are entrepreneurs. We're used to trying to get something done. And so we like to focus on what are the challenges between here and there and make things happen. Previously, the um, roundtables have been in topics such as uh, what are the practical challenges for utilities and grid operators to get to a, a carbon uh, neutral future? Uh, and from everywhere from the U.S., of course, to Germany and, and Italy and India, we've focused. We've also had one on uh, the potential role of hydrogen. You know, is it can it really be a storage vehicle? And can it also be a fuel for longer term, longer uh, distance goods movement? We've um, had uh, one on the um, built environment. And while it's everyone talks a lot about uh, energy efficiency and that, which is obviously incredibly important, you know, it's also, you know, how do you get, how do you electrify all these buildings so we can plug in our electric vehicles? Um, and occasionally we focus on a certain country. So uh, a couple months ago, we, we had a, a, a round table exclusively on India. And today our round table is going to be uh, on California and Australia. Now, the, the focus, the, the, the title of our roundtable is, you know, uh, Future Proofing the Wildlands from Wildfires. And you might be asking, well, why Australia? Why California? Uh, and the simple answer to that is uh, both, both regions uh, face tremendous threats from wildfires, catastrophic, continuous. I, I think our gl glide uh, patterns are about the same. We're both increasing at, at the uh, same rate. Um, in 2020, uh, or the, the season of 2019-2020, uh, Australia um, had a, a, a horrible uh, series of, of fires. I think it, one of the things that made them worse was that they were focused more on the eastern part of the country where most of the population uh, lives. Uh, my numbers say that almost 59 million acres were burned uh, which is 15 times the previous eight years combined. Um, and Australians refer to that time as the Black Summer. Um, of course, now most Black Summers happen, you, you get followed by mud and rain and slide. And that's, I think, what's happening in Australia now. Um, in California, during this, uh, not coincidentally, and during the same period of time, we had, I think, was the worst fire season we've ever had. Um, and my numbers indicate that that we uh, four million acres were burned. Uh, unfortunately, over thirty people died. Uh, Ten thousand structures were um, uh, destroyed. And I read that there were ten thousand fires during that fire season. Um, so it, the, we share a lot, Australia and California. Uh, together and we had engine uh, work quite a bit in in Australia, so we, we're going to hear from not only panelists from Australia but also entrepreneurs as well. And, and the format of our um, uh, talk today is a discussion among the panelists, and then we're going to have a showcase of four technology companies that are that are working in the fire tech area. Now, of course, it's not just a California Australia problem; it is a global problem. The UN came out with a new study that indicated that indicates that uh, 30,000 people 
have died from wildfires globally in 43 countries that were at, that were burning up 3,000 3 million hectares of, of uh, forest land around the world each year, which is roughly the size of Belgium. It's a lot of territory. And in Europe, just like in this in in this country, in Europe this summer, if you were going to Europe, you know that Portugal, uh, Spain, France, UK went through a, a tremendous uh, heat wave, which obviously are often connected to uh, uh, forest fires. Um, and to the point where I think the record numbers of, of, of fires were in, in Europe as well. Um, there were four times the, the average number of fires in the last 15, four times this year in 2020. Uh, so it was so hot that uh, there were fires breaking out in London, of all places. Now, that's, look, at statistics um, can, can put a tangible kind of envelope around a problem and but I don't, if, if you're like me, it doesn't really stick until it gets personal. You know, I've lived in uh, Los Angeles for a couple of decades and every summer uh, and fall, I'd watch on TV the, uh, the, the current fire being fought, whether it be close to in, in like Malibu or Ojai or uh, up north. And I, I would, you know, uh, feel empathy, be concerned, but you know, I'd turn the channel like most people go on my day because it didn't directly impact me. Uh, in 2020, during COVID, I was so uh, cabin fever, okay, and I'm a motorcyclist. Uh, so I thought what I would do is I'd get on my motorcycle and spend three weeks driving up the Pacific coast of, of California, Oregon, Washington, and seeing beautiful coasts and the forests and And while I had in the back of my mind, I had heard something about fires and, you know, it was another triple digit summer. I just wasn't really thinking about it. And so I got on my bike and I, I went north. And for the next three weeks, uh, I rode through what I would call the heart of dark darkness. Uh, it was 4,000 miles, six states, not one day was, was clear. It was always uh, smoke, thick smoke, sometimes so thick it looked like it was snow coming down. Um, roads closed all over. People in lines and cars uh, trying to get out. Businesses closed. You could see the orange on the other side of the mountains of, of fires. And you and I saw really up close and personal of, of the kind of catastrophe these wildfires um, create. Uh, and it, it, it brought it home uh, personally to me. And I concluded that this isn't going away. This is going to be our life in the near term, a series of, of, of uh, catastrophic um, events. Now, it forest fires don't just impact those that it uh, runs into in, in the near term. You know, I, obviously there's there's financial and human and personal emotional uh, um, devastation. But in those in those uh, fires I was talking about, smoke was seen all the way from the West Coast, all the way to Chicago, which is in the middle of our country, the U.S. Uh, I think there was enough, and in, in, in climate change and forest fires have this vicious cycle, because obviously climate change uh, makes the earth uh, much warmer, uh, weather events contributes to having uh, the um, right environment for forest fires, and then fires take place, and they emit uh, huge amounts of greenhouse gases, huge amounts of, of, of pollution. I think UCLA and the city of Chicago uh, just did a study that showed that the that the fire that I've been talking about, the fire season in 2020, those fires emitted uh, enough greenhouse gas and um, carbon dioxide, twice as amount of all the emissions that we have saved in California between 2003 and now, one fire. So it's all this, um, it, it's really closely linked. So the conclusion I have is that it's not going away. It's going to impact our entire life for a, um, a very long time, especially those of us in, in the Western US and Australia and but here's the good news. 
we can do something about it. There's there's ways of, of, of working on this and making it better. And that's what this panel really is all about today. We are going to uh, hear people that are working on it from uh, force management, from managing our policies relative to that, from the business world, uh, from entrepreneurial world uh, on what, what can we do? What's happening? What's their perspective on this uh, global problem and especially focus on California and Australia? So to moderate our discussion, I'd like to introduce uh, our moderator, Steve Ball. Steve is the director of sustainable projects at the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. It is the largest municipally owned utility in the country. And as its name implies, it deals in water and power. And by the way, water, power, and fire, not a good combo, but there's a lot of, of connectivity in there. Um, and Steve and I have worked together for probably close to 10 years, and, and he led our efforts to uh, partner with LADWP at the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator. So with no more further words, uh, Steve, take it away, please. Great. Thank you so much, Fred. Really appreciate the introduction. I think that really sets the tone for this panel. Um, and so without further ado, I'm going to introduce the panels. And uh, as Fred stated, we'll have a uh, discussion. The first part will be to discuss with this panel about the challenges that we're facing both here in the United States and California particularly, and then as well as in Australia. So our first panelist is Jessica Morris, who is the Deputy Secretary of Forest and Wildland Resiliency. Jessica Morris joined the California Natural Resource Agency in April 2019. As a Deputy Secretary, she is working to increase the pace and scale of science-based forest management to restore healthy forests, improve watershed health, protect California's unique ecosystems, and make Californians wild resistant, a wildfire resistant. Before joining Governor Newsom's administration, Jessica spent nearly 10 years in national security working for the Defense Department, State Department, and the U.S. Agency for International Development. Her assignments included a year and a half in Iraq and tours in India, Myanmar, and U.S. Pacific Command. Jessica is a fifth generation Northern California. She and her family still owns and manages their original homestead forest lands in the Sierra Foothills, which just sounds amazing. So I'll move over to Australia, and our next panelist is Lee Kelson. He's a program director for FireTech Connect. So Lee is a serial entrepreneur, cloud computing pioneer, web technologies veteran, public company CEO, and board member. Lee has founded 10 ventures over the last 30 years and had a number of successful exits and completed three successful public listings on the Australian Stock Exchange. In addition to assisting entrepreneurs to scale up, his current focus on improving Australian innovation, technology commercialization with a focus on fire tech. Lee is engaged, uh, mentor, advised portfolio of early state ventures on the commercialization strategy. He has led the commercialization of technologies in diverse range of sectors from entrepreneur cloud computing, web technologies, biotech, social media, entertainment, and fire tech. And to round it up, we have Nathan So. He's the resource planning staff officer at the Inyo National Forest. Nathan is born in California, raised in the Midwest. Uh, Nathan found his way back to California in 2008 and has enjoyed the last 15 years working for the state federal land management agency. He has managed a progressively complex and diverse resource program by maintaining effective collaboration with other forest service programs, agencies, and partners. He values working providing goods and service to the public through sustainable management of the resources owned by the public. Nathan has spent the last 13 years working in the Forest Service in Region 5. He recently took the Resource and Planning Staff Officer on the Inyo National Forest in 2018 and is responsible for the timber, fuels, hydrology, wildfire, botany, fisheries, planning, and GS programming on the Inyo. Previous to working on the Inyo, Nathan was also in the Angeles National Forest, which is just around the corner here in Los Angeles, and for the Bureau of Land Management and the Division of Wildfire Resources. We have a great panel. I'm really excited to uh, moderate this panel and get the thoughts and leadership um, on, this, on this topic. Um, I think what is really great is not only do we have Australia and Australia, but we also have a diverse perspective from that in the Forest Service, from that in state policy, and the private sector in Australia. So I'm actually going to hand it straight over to Nathan. 
who has really are been working in these forests and living in these forests uh, during all this time. And to hear about the challenges that are in California and the West, particularly also with the Forest Service. So Nathan, I have it over to you for the intro. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate that. Hello, everybody. I'm Nathan Sill. Um, for those of you who may not be aware of the U.S. Forest Service, I'll give you just a real brief introduction of our agency. We are the second largest federal land management agency in the U.S. We manage just over 190 million acres all across the country. Most of those lands are focused primarily in the western states. Um, in California, our agency manages over 30 million acres, um, so about half of the forested land mass in, in the state. Um, our, our agency manages across 18 units. I work on one of those 18 units, and that's the Inyo National Forest. And for those of you who may not be aware of where that is, um, I will show you a map of where the Inyo is located spatially um, here in the state. So down here, San Diego, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and here is the Inyo National Forest, this green, um, this green highlighted area. So as you can see, we are on the eastern side of the Sierra Nevada mountains, um, and we are just right around 2 million acres. You know, the situation that Fred described um, is becoming not just a California problem, but a Western states problem here in the US. Um, you know, fire frequency and severity is, is not just something that California deals with anymore. And this is really a product of past forest management practices, primarily fire exclusion for the last hundred, over a hundred years in the Western states. And so now our forests are in an overly dense, overstocked condition, and we're more prone to fires, we're more prone to disease, we're more prone to pests, and all of these factors in, in combination with um, climate change um, has created the, this um, firestorm, and apologies for the pun, but it's, it's not a, a fun situation to be in, and it's not a good place for our agency or um, you know our forest to be in. So, so some of the challenges that we deal with here in California and specifically on the Inyo are what to do with these overly dense or overstocked forests. Um, the simple solution might would you know you would think would be to just go out and thin the forests, uh, but then what do you do with that material? We don't have an industry, a private industry that is built to withstand or deal with the volume of material that needs to come off of these um, public and private lands as well. And so that's one of our significant challenges right now is what to do with all of the trees that, that need to come off of the landscape. You know, in particular in the Eastern Sierras, we don't have a dimensional, a dimensional lumber market. There is no mill anywhere within a, an economical driving distance from our forest. The closest one is in Carson City, which is about a three hour drive away. And as you can imagine, trying to haul material that's very heavy across mountain passes um, three hours away does not make for a very economical um, lumber market. And so we're trying to find some creative biomass utilization solutions. Um, but those are really dependent upon private investment um, and private industry to build, to build the infrastructure to deal with that material. And so right now, our only viable solution is to burn that material, which, um, you know, when we burn it on, on our sort of terms, um, we get better outcomes, but we still have to deal with smoke. We still have to deal with um, you know, other potential negative outcomes. It's not the most ideal scenario. And so um, really biomass utilization is, is the key to solving our problem here locally, but also across the Western states. Um, you know, and ways we're trying to work or, or find solutions with that is, is looking to private investment as well as public investment in this work, both the Forest Service as well as the state of California have invested billions of dollars in this work. And so really trying to ramp up the amount of work that we get done on the ground. Um, and also building the, the private industry and infrastructure around that work. So having private contractors to be able to go out and implement this work on the ground is also a significant challenge. Um, so 
we're really trying to be creative with how we build partnerships and leverage uh, investments from both the public, public and private sector um, to be able to increase the pace and scale of the work that needs to happen on the ground. Um, you know, just on our unit alone, if we don't increase the, the amount of acreage that we treat on the landscape by about fivefold every year, we're never going to get back to a, a normal sort of what we would call a natural range of variation. Um, and until we are able to increase the amount of treatments um, to be able to, to ramp up fivefold on an annual basis, we're going to continue to see this kind of fire behavior. Um, and fortunately for the Inyo, we are one of those forests in California that has not seen huge catastrophic fires in the way and, and um, you know, that have taken out entire towns. And that's what we are trying to get ahead of um, and trying to stay ahead of. So, you know, with that, I guess I will turn it back over to Steve um, for the next panel member. Thank you. Thanks, Nathan. That was super interesting. It's, you know, I, I definitely want to come back and talk a little bit more about these the thinning materials as well as some of these ideas of prevention and, and how that can be uh, helpful for, for the forest. Um, Jessica, you know, also working in California, we'll, we'll keep here to California for right now. Um, what are some of the lessons that you learned? Friend really talked about some of the 2020 uh, fire season, which was, you know, just horrific here uh, in the United States. And, you know, how is the state and particularly um, looking at ways for future strategies on forest resiliency. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, and really a pleasure to talk with you all today. So as Nathan mentioned, um, you know, the fire crisis is growing at, at, a, cat at, at a catastrophic rate. Um, what we've been seeing is um, a combination of, you know, old policy decisions that led to those incredibly dense homogenous forests that we have today um, being compounded by climate change, extreme heat, extreme drought, leading to high intensity tree mortality in the Southern Sierra. You know, you were seeing 90% tree mortality in some areas. We had 169 million trees die um, from the first wave of this drought between 2012 and 2015. Um, and by the time 2020 rolled around, there were dead standing trees throughout all of California's watersheds. And then you get hottest, you know, heat wave on the planet in uh, in 2020 and where California clocked in 130 degree temperature. And um, and we saw all of that dead fuel that had been dead standing trees by the time 2020 rolled around, they were on the ground. Um, and you just saw exponential growth of fire um, just phenomenal fires that were creating their own weather systems, like the Creek Fire created a 50,000 foot pyrocumulus, which then means that the fire, the, the capacity to fight the fire is really dynamic and hard because it's burning so hot and creating that weather. It's creating fire tornadoes. It's creating um, its own lightning strikes. And then when that column of smoke collapses, when you see those pyrocumulus that look like mushroom cloud clouds, those collapse they put out hurricane force wind in every direction. So the fire, instead of having one flaming front grows in a circumference, kind of like a splat. And um, it's incredibly difficult to fight. And, um, and so it's dangerous for people, it's dangerous for firefighters. It's also really dangerous and bad for the ecology because it's burning at ho such high severity that you're seeing um, the, the entire ecology break down. Um, so it, it particularly in our upper watersheds. Um, so a lot of these fires of the previous couple of years have been heavily focused in California's upper watersheds. The Inyo where Nathan's working, that actually is about 30% of the uh, water to LA County. Um, and uh, the whole Sierra range is about 60% of the water through to the entirety of California. So when you see the watersheds burn at high severity, the mountains themselves don't percolate and store the water properly anymore. It just runs off and it disrupts our entire sort of forest to faucet connectivity. And so then it exacerbates drought and the, which then exacerbates fire and we're in this compounding cycle. So the question is, what do we do about it? Um, and, and so what we've been doing in California is investing in wildfire resilience. And just for context, for those of you, I'm Deputy Secretary of the California Natural Resources Agency, which is the parent agency for CAL FIRE, state parks, Department of Fish and Wildlife, all of our state conservancies. There's about 26 departments in our agency 
and all of them have a role to play in wildfire resilience. And so we said, we need to rethink this paradigm uh, and we need to fund up um, the investments here. And so we're investing across three fronts of wildfire resilience. Um, and, and that means that we can get to a point, resilience means we get to a point where communities can live with fire and fire is playing the natural adaptive role it's supposed to play in these ecologies, right? Just like light rain is good for the environment, light fire is good for the environment, but catastrophic uh, hurricanes, not great, just like catastrophic fires, not great. And so that's what we're trying to get back to is have fire play its natural ecological role across these landscapes. Um, and so there's three fronts to really achieve resilience. Um, and I like to think of them like concentric circles. So picture a bullseye with me. So the investments we make are inside of communities. That's your first round where you're investing in um, home hardening, defensible space. We know that homes burn from the inside out during a wildfire. So it's embers getting into the attics. It's, um, you know, plants or vegetation next to the windows or the walls that cause those, you know, the windows to burst and flames get in. So we have um, building code standards and then tactics to retrofit buildings built before these standards were put in so that homes can be hardened. And we have that, uh, that when embers are falling on the home, they're not going to ignite. Um, the next round, and so that's our community interventions. The next round are interventions around communities. So that's where you're gonna hear us talk about wildfire fuel breaks. Um, and those fuel breaks are often long strips of land, like maybe um, 600 feet wide, couple miles long in some cases, where the forest or the vegetation has been thinned back to more of its natural um, fire resilient state. So it's not, they're not necessarily very big, um, but we saw in the Calder fire last summer that burnt into Lake Tahoe area, um, that fire, we saw the flame lengths go from 150 feet, so a 15 story building of fire. Um, then th when it hit the fuel break, only a 600 foot wide fuel break, it dropped down in those trees down to 15 foot flame lengths. But when I stood in that fuel break, you look around, it looks still like a forest. It's just removed the understory and um, what we call ladder fuels, things that would allow the fire to get to the canopy. So it kept the fire on the ground, which made that fire a little cooler and allowed firefighters to then be able to approach it directly and then to be able to um, put water on it and, uh, and dirt. And so the, these fuel breaks are placed throughout the state that give us a tactical advantage on the ground. For firefighters, they also create safe evacuation routes for communities um, during big fires. The last area, so you've got interventions in the community, interventions around the community, and then interventions across the whole landscape. That's where we're talking about sort of these forested watersheds, your uh, rolling oak woodlands, right? There's a lot of different ecozone types in California. They all have a different fire regime on them. And so we want to get back to a state where we do by hand what 100 years of fire should have done so that uh, when fire hits, it burns at its natural intensity and you're not getting those 50,000 foot pyrocumulus weather systems, right? Being created by such high intensity, high severity fires. And so what's really crucial though, is that you need the combination of all three of those to be able to create a state of wildfire resilience. You're lowering that fire intensity on the landscape. You're giving a tactical advantage for when fires get big around communities, and then you're creating um, a saturation level of, of hardened homes with defensible space so that communities and neighborhoods are less likely to ignite during a fire. So these are all three safety tactics. Um, what is really exciting is that because we know that these strategies work, the challenge we've been having is getting them to scale. So in 2020 um, or in 2021, California passed the largest fire resilience budget we've seen, and then we did it again this year. So in the last two years, we've invested $2.8 billion into wildfire resilience activities alone. Um, and we also changed our state business practices, including our contracting processes and our environmental regulations, um, our, our environmental processes, we didn't want to dilute any of the really crucial oversight that happens there, but we created expedited processes so we could get projects on the ground within about four weeks of getting money, as opposed to what used to take two years to just get through the bureaucracy. And so 
what we've done is now with this funding, we've been able to actually get over a thousand new projects on the ground um, in quite in, in record time, just within the last year. And, and that was a huge advantage this fire season. So fires we were finding were actually hitting those fuel breaks. So this fire season, we had um, a significantly uh, less impactful fire season than the previous years. So we had the same number of fires. We had about 7,000 fires this year, about 7,800 fires last year. Last year, we burned it, it burned 2.5 million acres um, and you had over 3,000 homes um, or structures damaged or destroyed. This year, those 7,000 fires burned 360,000 acres and you only had 880 homes damaged or destroyed. Um, and then, I mean, and that pales to previous years, right? You heard already in 2020, we had four over 4 million acres burned and 10,000 homes destroyed. In 2018, over 30,000 homes destroyed, 185 lives lost. So, I mean, you had major damage and destruction from these mega fires. And this fire season, we're starting to get a grip on it. And it was really a factor of three things, and then I'll pass um, then I'll wrap this up, but three things really impacted that success that we saw this fire season. We had some help from the weather. Um, you know, moisture came in at sort of key moments, which was helpful. Um, and we also had some additional investments in fire suppression, which gave firefighters that technical advantage. We had um, 18 uh, what we call heli tankers, which are um, helicopters that have a water capacity close to a C-130 and allows them to do really fast initial attack, uh, slowing those fires down that are get big and getting firefighters to approach them. And most crucially, we had a lot of these fuel breaks and fuel reduction actions in place. So there was a fire called the Oak Fire that nobody heard of this year, which day one projections was that it was going to wipe out a town called Grass Valley. And instead, um, we were able to get, it was spotting a mile in advance. So that, that meant the, the fire was flying through the air a mile and we started, those embers were igniting um, uh, fires a mile in advance. What was amazing is that that fire, uh, those spots that we could not get to in time, they landed right in some fuel breaks that we had been working on outside of the town of Colfax and, um, and were able to uh, actually put themselves out. Um, and so these fires then did not get big because there, there just wasn't fuel for them to ignite um, when they were spotting way ahead, which is always the sign of a really bad fire. Um, there's a couple other great examples too, like uh, uh, another fire um, called the Electra fire around the 4th of July um, was going to be really big. Again, it hit a fuel break on day one. It was a 5,000 acre fire, hit a fuel break um, in some oak woodlands on the first day, it burned under the trees, stopped at a road. Um, and then uh, and then it they were able to get a grip on that fire, uh, which again, the first day projection, we anticipated that to at least be 50,000 acres within a couple of days, if not bigger. Um, and so what we're seeing is a lot of these fires that were going to get really big, hit that tactical combination of fire resilience, uh, in addition to our fire suppression actions and enabled us to keep this fire uh, season a lot, um, a lot more manageable. And I just want to caveat that, though, like we're not sort of declaring victory here, um, that the climate conditions we're facing are going to get more extreme. Our interventions are getting better. Um, and and these are safety tactics, right? Think of them like seat belts and anti-lock -like brakes in a car, right? It improves survival and safety um, and makes accidents less damaging, but it doesn't prevent if the car goes off a cliff, right, the, the damage. And so... We're, we're, this isn't going to be sort of a straight line down um, to success, but this year we really saw that the resilience investments we've made are paying off. And so, and we want to keep that momentum up um, and keep ahead of the climate conditions we're facing. So lots of hope on the horizon, lots of hard work from a lot of departments out there and an excellent partnership we have with the Forest Service as well. So thanks. And I'll hand it back to Steve. Great, thank you. Jessica. It's super interesting. It's great to hear that a lot of this prevention work that you know the fourth thing that Nathan was hitting up on is is actually making an impact. Um, you know, I want kind of leading into leads. You know, kind of circle back to your idea of these sort of concentric circles that that um, are needed. And you know, I 
it's, I think that's important because if you look at the different types of sectors, you know, it's going to require work not just from agencies, policymakers, but everyone from the community, private sector, um, entrepreneurs, and so forth. So that's why I want to hand it over to Lee, who has a really successful rate of working within Australia um, and setting up his, uh, his, his entrepreneurship in this, in this region. I was kind of hoping you can, you know, talk a little bit about um, how Australia is organizing and collaborating to develop fire prevention and also uh, engage in this uh, fire fighting tech. Yeah, thanks, Steve, and um, it's uh, uh, delighted to to be here with you all today. So, just to put a little bit of context, um, I, I suppose I, I position myself as a recovering entrepreneur. I'm uh, based out of. Uh, Noosa Heads in Queensland. Um, I've been in and around the tech business for the, over 30 years and has spent a lot of time uh, living and working out of the United States, both on the eastern seaboard and out of California. Um, and Noosa Heads is a place that has uh, been very dear to my heart for many, many years. Um, it's a fantastic environmental region, about two hours um, north of, uh, of Brisbane on the eastern seaboard of Australia. Um, and in conjunction really with the Noosa Shire Council, um, there was a, a, a guy by the name of Chris Bowden who runs the digital hub. And perhaps I'll just share my screen to give you some context of, um, uh, hopefully you can see, see that. Um, so that's where Noosa is located. Um, and, and as part of the Noosa Shire Council, they created a, an initiative which is called the Perigian Digital Hub. And it's a, a sort of a digital facility to help develop um, the uh, technology ecosystem within Noosa. And Noosa uh, predominantly is known for uh, it being a holiday playground for Australia and international visitors. Um, it's, as I mentioned, amazing um, beaches and uh, forest areas and natural environment. Um, Chris Bowden, who is the director of the digital hub out of Perigian, um, really approached me and um, it was after the 19, uh, the, the 1920 uh, Black Summer fires where the digital hub had only been open for, I think, about two years at the time. Um, and literally just missed out on um, being taken out by a, a pretty significant fire. Um, and so it was sort of in those conversations where, you know, we were coming at it purely from a technical perspective is, you know, why aren't we using some technology in this space? Why aren't we using some of the defence technologies that we're seeing for communications and for detection? And um, why aren't we using... Um, uh, drones more actively for situational awareness. Uh, so we really sort of got together initially and said, well, um, what is happening in this space? Um, and we looked around and found that there wasn't a lot happening in this space to drive and develop the ecosystem around fire technology. However, we did find there's a number of companies and a number of early stage companies. And one of my passions um, since I... Um, step back uh, from my um, entrepreneurial activities has been both from a research perspective in technology commercialization and also uh, supporting uh, early stage ventures uh, in their path to commercialization. And so it seemed to be a pretty natural fit to uh, create, if you like, a category. So how do we start to think about this as a category? We're familiar with med tech and fintech. Um, and those types of more mature categories of technology, but, and you know, we've got broader categories like climate tech and environment tech, but how do we sort of create this, carve out this niche category of fire tech? And so as we started to do our research, we found that there was a, a number of companies around um, that were struggling to either get funding or get on a path to commercialization. And that sort of really, the, we've sort of covered in four major areas is detection, prediction, um, autonomous systems, um, and and then you've also got sort of all the the uh, the big data piece of the, that, and then uh, the fire air traffic management piece. So they're sort of the broad categories that we've looked at and said, how can we start to help develop those? So we've been working with um, both the federal government in Australia through our uh, NEMA, which is the National Emergency Management Association, and one of the areas that we found was really challenging is it's a little bit like um, 
I, I liken it a little bit to the pharmaceutical industry. You know, we don't go and create vaccines or medications and then just start selling them into the market. There's has to be some sort of intermediary that that sits in between to test efficacy and prove prove that these um, these medications actually do what they say they're going to do on on the tin, so to speak. Um, and it's not dissimilar in terms of the trust that you have with the agencies. You know, the agencies in the middle of a catastrophic fire are not going to start using technology that is untested, untried um, and, and tested in the field. So uh, we said, OK, well, here's an opportunity to create what we're calling our fire tech lab. And, and typically uh, in, in fire and emergency management, there is a lot of facilities where we can train firefighters and we can test widgets and gadgets and pumps and hoses and things that are specific to the traditional approach, which is more trucks, more, more people. And that's how we sort of throw more people and more trucks at the problem. Um, but we found that there was really nowhere where a company could come in and engage with an agency and run a controlled environment, controlled test, um, you know, a clinical trial, to, to use the analogy, of that particular technology. And so in conjunction with Noosa Shire Council, under the leadership of uh, Chris Bowden, um, they sort of, I suppose, you know, seconded me in um, as, as the grizzled veteran of the uh, entrepreneurial tech world and said, you know, can you help us drive this and create this um, the, the, this sort of ecosystem, if you like, around the fire technology? And that's essentially what we've been doing for the last two and a half years. Um, we've had great support from obviously Noosa Shire Council and the federal government. Um, and part of the initiative we've been running over the last two years is, you know, if you like, it started out as a little accelerator program. We'd find three or four promising companies that we could help accelerate the commercialization. Then we realized that really we need some testing areas. So we've created an environment lab where we've got, you know, what I call the IoT of fires. Um, we've got, and we're going to see some of that technology um, later today, but we've got um, artificial in intelligence camera detection networks. We've got satellite detection, ground truthing capabilities. We've got a LoRaWAN uh, connectivity. We've got Starlink. We've got a robotics testing area for autonomous systems. Um, we've got a drone fly zone. And now we're in the process of building our uh, intelligence data lab, which will be open hopefully in February next year. Um, and that's really the fire tech initiative. We've been working closely with other partners in Australia, like uh, Mindaroo Foundation, which is a philanthropic organisation. And, you know, from a fire tech perspective, it is a local government initiative with the idea that we can take the, the knowledge that we gather and share it with other local uh, communities uh, across Australia and also around the world to help build the resilience and help drive the adoption of the, the technologies. And I'll just wrap up by saying one of the challenges that uh, that I see all the time is we often in technology talk about the technology readiness levels. Um, and from an operational perspective in the agencies, we really need to start thinking about how do we get to a systems readiness level? And that is really the key to driving the adoption, uh, building the trust and also getting our systems ready, not just in, the, in isolation, a piece of technology, but how do we view it in terms of getting our systems readiness level? Uh, so that's that's where we're at with Firetech. We, you know, surprisingly have have struggled to get uh, corporate support here in Australia. Uh, we've had some philanthropic support. Um, we've had uh, some obviously federal government's been a great supporter. Uh, the state government in Queensland uh, support and the local government. So we've had three tiers of government support. Um, but interestingly, it's been challenging to get uh, the corporate support that I would have thought a couple of years ago when we started this initiative would have been uh, relatively, um, well, certainly easier than it has been to get that level of support. Great. Well, thankfully, that's really interesting to hear, um, you know, how uh, you and Australia are sort of working on this tech issue of particularly of trying to get systems ready rather than, um, you know, having, you know, products that work, but actually developing into how policy is being done on the floor. Um, you know, we have a quick time to get, you know, to do uh, some some questions before we get into some of these clean tech companies. Nathan, I kind of want to go back to you since you work a lot on these uh, forests and, you know, you mentioned particularly this biomass, which is, you know, a big question that you have. But I was also wondering, you know, as far as, you know, looking at a fire tech company 
that's being implemented on the force, you know, what are some lessons learned? Um, and what are, you know, some tech implementations that you're seeing that are being successful? Yeah, I think in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of investment and a lot of interest in trying to develop some of these um, predictive tools, maybe you'd call them, or or at least prioritization tools for, for us to be able to understand um, where they would get the most bang from from their buck, so to speak. Um, where where should we treat first if we're trying to protect a, a certain asset or a piece of ground or a community? Um, what um, what treatment area would give you the best outcomes if you're forced to prioritize or or um, limit how many acres you can treat based on the available resources you have, based on the available funding or um, companies that are able to do that work. And so I think that in the in the last two years especially has been a, a real big um, investment, if you will, in both the private sector as well as um, the federal sector. Our, our uh, research stations in combination with a lot of um, private um, you know, researchers through local universities, as well as the state of California, have developed a number of different tools that units can use to prioritize treatments. Um, so that's been that's been a real asset. You know, the one thing I would say, I think there's still a lot of room for improvement on going back to something that Lee said is the use of drone technology, especially as it relates to putting fire on back on the landscape in the right way. Um, we are, as an agency, trying to build up our UAS um, program to be able to use them to, to put fire back on the landscape in the right way. But, you know, as a bureaucracy, it just takes way too much time. I think there's, I think there's a private investment opportunity there that could be a real key and a real asset to being able to build that program. Um, yeah. Does that partially answer your question, Steve? Yeah, no, that's, I think that's helpful. You know, I, I know we, you know, identifying, you know, technology that is needed, I think is a, you know, a big part of what Engine does. So uh, I think that's, that's, that's helpful to, to hear and see, you know, how things are being implemented in the forest. Now, Jessica, you talked yeah, a, a little bit about, oh, go for it. I was just going to add one thing that, you know, Lee mentioned um, cameras and AI technology to try and better identify when we have fire starts. And I think in California, the topography is a bit, a bit different and allows for that, um, maybe in a more effective way than other parts of the world. Um, we have a pretty, a pretty robust camera network here in California. And at any given time, you might have a number of cameras that are pointed at any piece of ground where you can pick up um, early fire starts in, ad in addition to that, we have a lot of communities that are built within our forested areas. And so, you know, people tend to find these fires long before agencies do and call them in. So I think on the early detection piece, um, we're, we have some advantages maybe that other parts of the world don't. That's really interesting. So, you know, Jessica, you heard about a little bit what Australia is doing on sort of this collaborative approach. Uh, you know, can you talk a little bit and talk how California is, you know, engaging the private sector, other agencies, and, and collaborating? It's, it's also kind of interesting to hear, uh, you know, the lack of corporate support that's going on in Australia. Is, is that also something indicative for California? Mm. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And um, I think we've been having a little more success on the public private partnerships. Um, and there's kind of two levels to them. So there's public private partnerships that are helping us tackle what do we do with all this extra woody material coming off um, and and really helping us kind of ramp up wood utilization slash consumption so that we're not having these I mean, we have slash piles that are the size of strip malls. You know, they're just enormous. And um, and we're having to actually devote whole fire crews to these slash piles during an active fire so that you don't have a Roman candle go up in the middle of an already complicated firefight. And so um, finding technologies 
that will help um, use that woody material in a way that's more constructive than a wildfire and more uh, beneficial than just open pile burning is really important for us. And so we have a couple institutions to engage with. We have the Joint Institute for Wood Products Innovation um, at the US board, at the uh, California Board of Forestry, the forest services on that as well um, as some private industry partners. And we've been really looking at the types of technology that, um, that exist already or that we could scale in California to use this. So that's everything from, um, you know, classic lumber sequesters a lot of carbon um, to mass timber, right, where you're building uh, manufactured wood that replaces steel and concrete in skyscrapers um, or, you know, converting that to some type of bioenergy or uh, biofuel. So there's technology that can convert this to jet fuel to fly airplanes, um, liquid natural gas replacements. So really thinking through, and there's, a, I mean, I saw somebody who's taking, you know, manzanita slash and turning it into lotion. So, you know, there's a a lot of um, creativity happening in this space and innovation. And so the question is then how do we scale it? And so our investments from the state are technology agnostic, but what we've been trying to do is to create an environment more palatable to the private sector to come in here. So creating stability in the feedstock supply. So saying, hey, if you're gonna open a new mill or a mass timber facility, um, you no need to know that you're gonna have 10 years of guaranteed supply and since, as you heard Nathan say, like the state doesn't own much of this. Um, we own 3% of the forest, the forest, the feds own 57% and um, the uh, and the rest is private. And so we changed how we do our state uh, funded grants so that the projects um, expire after seven years instead of after two years, meaning somebody can give out a seven year supply agreement um, off of that grant rather than saying, well, I know I'm gonna do this grant, like reapply three times to get this whole watershed done, um, but I can't guarantee you the supply because I can only guarantee the two years. So we changed the business practice to try to create some stability we're also investing um, throughout the state in these little feedstock broker pilots. It's sort of groups like that would aggregate um, feedstock from different um, smaller projects and then be able to then be the ones that sell a 10 year supply agreement to a potential manufacturer. Um, so we're trying to create some stability there. We also created something called the Climate Catalyst Fund. It's low interest loans and loan guarantees for anybody wanting to come into the wood utilization for a sector space. Um, and so that's going to be, um, it, because rural banks used to fund the work in this space, commercial banks are not well adapted to forest type act activities. And so this gives access to capital. So we're trying to reduce the risk um, to starting up businesses and manufacturing in the space. The other area that we're investing with private partners is, is in the technology, like you heard Lee talking about, which is like spatial analytics, better data, better modeling, better processing, so that we can really build in the climate modeling that we're looking at. We have um, a pro bono effort with google.org right now, for example, where we're getting um, Google engineers partnering with Forest Service and state um, experts to try to develop um, a, a tool to help us better plan our projects with more precision using a lot of the data that we're acquiring. We just acquired um, LIDAR across the whole state. So now the state is going to have a laser map across it uh, where you can see sort of after these more recent fires, what's the impact? What's the vegetation structure? What's the understory? What's converting? Um, and uh, I mean, just a whole myriad. And then better technology for fire detection, even um, like you heard Lee talking about. So, you know, we're investing in everything from in exploring technologies. So we have an R&D, a research and development division at Cal Fire that's looking at that. So, you know, there's uh, cool things like, um, you know, experimenting with these, uh, you know, balloons that are in the stratosphere that are then stationary that allow you to detect fire um, down to like the level of a campfire with really clear precision or satellite networks um, to help us see where fires are or watch the smoke. And so, you know, that type of precision and accuracy is really critical because, you know, we see in things like a fire where the town of Grizzly Flats was lost, the fire was called into the wrong location. And so it took them a lot longer to then find it uh, because they had been uh, misled as to where it was. And so that caused the fire to get bigger faster and caused the Caldor fire, which was very devastating for anyone who was here in California. 
Um, so the technology and the public-private partnerships are moving forward. We're seeing a lot more investors being interested in the space, and the state is trying desperately to um, create some stability and predictability here to make it an easier environment for private capital to come in and innovate. That's great. Super interesting. Yeah, before we, we bring in the these companies, um, I just want Lee to kind of close this out. I, you know, Jessica, what you mentioned about the state trying to reduce the risk of these companies to to start, and I, as, as a serial entrepreneur, or former serial entrepreneur that Lee is, um, you know, what are some of the risks that you're seeing that these companies are facing in, in, in Australia, and, you know, how, how are you trying to mitigate those? Yeah, so I think it's uh, it's interesting. Um, it, my perspective is is a little bit into the California space. Obviously, I've had um, a long history with uh, the Valley and and San Francisco, um, and so I have um, a lot of collaborators. And in fact, some of the mentors within the Firetech program are based out of California. So the perspective is, uh, and also we have a number of companies. So. In the Firetech network now, we have over 130 companies globally. So we have companies uh, from South Korea, South Africa, uh, Denmark, um, Scandinavia, Germany, uh, and throughout the US and, and Canada and even you know South America. So seeing a broad uh, cross-section of technologies around uh, around the world. And I think you know one of the things that uh, come out of that uh, across the board is the you know the funding uh, the the venture life cycle the view, the view of looking at how do we fund the life cycle of the venture rather than you know we always hear about early stage funding but how do we support the the venture through its um, various maturity stages um, and and supporting that and then I think the second thing is you know the idea of decoupling the capability development of these companies you know we've got a lot of very smart um, technologists. Who've, who've developed some really interesting technologies. But again, the gap seems to be around the commercialization. How do we take that to the point where we can actually get it to a, a commercial, uh, commercially viable? And how do we build the business model? And how do we think about our, our go to market and our strategies? And, um, and, and then also looking at the assessment of, um, you know, demand readiness levels and market readiness levels, which is really the assessment of if we build this technology or we develop this technology, um, are we going to sell it once? Are we going to sell it twice? Are we going to sell it a million times? Um, and I also think is I come back to this systems readiness approach. Um, and, and that is, I think there's two parts. If you think about digital technologies, particularly in, in, in specific to fire tech is um, whether it's drones, whether it's spatial, whether it's um, LIDAR, uh, whatever technology you're looking at, it all throws off data. So, data, data, data. And in order to train our um, algorithms and the artificial intelligence machine learning components, data is key. The quantum of data you need to train those is um, off the scale. So the more data we can get, the better in that regard. But from an agency perspective around the data is, how do we make sense of it? How do we create actionable insights? And how do we help that support decisions in, in the in the field, right? Um, and so that's the orchestration of data. It is the uh, distillation of data so that we, you know, I, I mentioned in, in the conversation when we were leading up to this, that if, when I talked to a lot of the agencies in Australia and both here and in the US, um, we often, I've, I've heard a number of times, you know, um, where they say out of almost exasperation, don't give us more data. And what they're, what they're saying is it's not, we don't want data. We, we don't need the quantum of data that these devices throw off. We need it distilled and delivered to us in a way that helps us make decisions. It's the intelligence that we need from it, not the, the data itself, right? That's, that's the key. Um, so how do we do, how do we create that? And then I think from a from a, 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 a you know a company's perspective, the early stage tech companies is they need to start thinking about systems readiness. Um, but one of the challenges is that in a normal environment, when I say normal environment, where it's outside the agencies that would be procuring these types of technologies in a private sector environment, um, a lot of the early stage companies have the opportunity to do discovery with those 
companies or potential customers. They can get in front of the customer and they can say, hey, we're looking at building this. What does it look like? And obviously that iteration loop and that customer feedback loop is imperative in the early stage where we're looking at developing minimal viable product or MVP. Um, in the agencies where we've got procurement and probity and bureaucracy, it's a lot more challenging for those companies to get access to those agencies to do that level of discovery. And so that is, is also a, a challenge in, in this sector. Um, so they're the things that we're doing is saying, okay, how do we get how do we get to the data to the point where we can bring all of these things together, uh, make sense of it? How do we throw off data from these environment labs that we can give to these tech companies where they can use that to start training their algorithms? And how do we start collaborating and working with agencies? And, you know, I view it in a pretty simplistic way. The sell side is the companies. The buy side is the, is the agencies. How do we bring buy side and sell side together uh, in a more collaborative, cohesive way? And the idea behind a, a, a laboratory sort of model like this is that they can come in and feel, you know, the agency can come in and feel free to, um, you know, test, play, break things in, in that environment that perhaps they, they're not afforded in their, in their typical sort of agency governmental environment. Oh, that's great. Perfect timing um, for, this, for this conversation. So uh, I just want to thank uh, Nathan, Jessica, and Lee for, for the first part. And um, I'll hand it over to Fred, who's going to introduce and, uh, and bring in the, the clean tech company so we can further on this discussion. Sure. So, um, been fascinating. I have a lot of questions I want to ask, and but I'll wait and hold my tongue, which is unusual for me. Um, and let's bring in the four founders and leaders of these uh, fire tech companies. Uh, can we get them on screen? Here's going to be the format as we're going to do that. Um, because we want to make sure that we would avoid any technical challenges or time challenges, we've asked these four CEOs and leaders to uh, tape a product-oriented presentation uh, and we're going to go through those. And then when we're done with those, uh, we will open it up to discussions and questions and answers and so forth. Um, so the first person that uh, is up, the first company that is up is uh, Rob James. Rob, raise your hand. Um, he is the managing director of Firestory. Um, and we're going to hear about their, their uh, technology. And then we'll come back and we'll go to the next company. So... Um, uh, Jake, I think you're, would you uh, play the video for? Uh, uh, yes, give me just one story. second. Yeah. And welcome, folks, by the way. Yeah. I was going to say it's late, but it's probably earlier where you are. So, yeah. Three of these companies are from Australia. One is from the U.S., I think. Here we go. Hi, and thanks for your time today to allow me to tell you a little bit about our product, Firestory. My name is Rob James, and I'm the Managing Director of Firestory. I've been a technologist for over 30 years and a senior executive for 15 of those. I've worked for organizations like Qantas as their group CTO and Vodafone TPG as their group Chief Digital and Information Officer. So why build Firestory in the first place? Well, we were inspired by the devastating effects of the 2019-2020 bushfire season in Australia, where over 33 people were killed, 3 billion animals lost, 16 million hectares savaged by the bushfires, and a damage bill of over $200 billion, or the equivalent of 10% of Australia's GDP. And we felt that we could, uh, we could put a team together that could do something to help. A team with experience in media, finance, and spatial software that harnesses the power of machine learning. We felt that there was an opportunity to use this technology to give the people fighting the fires on the front lines with the tools and information that they needed. We were so confident that we could do something that we truly believed in, the, in ultimately realizing what is our very ambitious vision, which is to never lose another life in a wildfire ever again. Now, whilst doing our research and going through the discovery journey, we learned a lot about the wildfire cycle. 
And this is after working and talking to multiple firefighting agencies around Australia and the world. And also realizing that many of the solutions and products out there focus on one section of the cycle. We saw this as an opportunity to bring this together, shaping a platform that provides ongoing intelligence that is collected and fed back into every decision making process at, the stage of, uh, at every stage of the cycle. Whether in the planning phase, when teams are preparing for a wildfire season through risk assessment modeling or hazard re reduction, into the early detection of wildfire ignitions using hotspot detection or image recognition, then being able to effectively manage a wildfire incident by using predictive modeling and managing the deployment of critical assets or the protection of property and the assets in the fire's path. To finally providing deep analysis post incident that helps learn and influence the planning for the next wildfire season. So this is our solution, fire story. It's a wildfire intelligence platform and instead of simply being a data visualization tool, Firestory provides tools and features to surface uh, the insights from masses of data and is flexible and scalable to quickly leverage new and emerging capabilities. So let me explain a little bit more about how it does that. And first off, in the planning phase, what Firestory's wildfire intelligence doesn't start when a fire is ignited. We realize the need for fire modeling and planning in the off season, or even like now in Australia, when we're experiencing floods in instead of bushfires. We're actively investing in and developing tools and models which allow senior firefighters and incident controls to understand how wildfires, uh, wildfire risk will change or evolve over variable timeframes. We factor in many of the variables, including vegetation growth, climate change, weather conditions, and so on. And we also include what the economic cost of the fires could on the communities themselves. Into the early stage detection, using hotspot detection, satellite imagery and even social media sentiment analysis the platform takes this information and feeds it into our fire detection and modeling using a combination of these feeds firestory uses self-training smoke and fire image recognition models as well as satellite data to detect and confirm fires in the landscape now once fire is identified on the landscape the platform switches into its incident management mode here point ignition predictions are automatically triggered providing firefighters with a probability of burn for that, for that fire over the next 12 hours. And it does that in minutes. The system is currently capable of running Phoenix Rapid Fire as well as CSIRO Spark. Our cloud ar architecture allows us to run any fire modeling tool you desire. For example, we're actively exploring uh, Prometheus at the moment. This is all tied together with our real-time collaboration tools and automated notifications for potential impacts on infrastructure for the next 12 hour period. But managing, managing an incident doesn't end when the wildfire is extinguished. Everything that happens in an incident is recorded in our chronological incident feeds so that it is reportable and fed back into decision making at every other stage of the cycle. We collate this data in 4D, which is uh, latitude, longitude, elevation and time to provide our users with incredibly rich data sets that can be fed into experimental models around suppression modeling and even resource allocation as an example all to help plan for the next wildfire season. And this is a real platform that we've been developing for the last two years. It has been developed by highly capable and skilled technical engineers. We've already won several awards for pushing the boundaries of what technology can do to help ensure we never have to live through a devastating fire season again. For those that are interested, we would be delighted to demonstrate the platform to you. So please reach out and contact me directly and we'll organize some time to do that. Thanks for your time today. Uh, Fred, you're muted. There we go. Thank you, Rob. Good. Um, we're next Thanks, up Fred. is Dr. Gilberto De Salvo, who is the CEO of Delphire, a uh, U.S. company. And uh, Gilberto, it's uh, up to you in your video. Thank you. Are you guys playing it or am I playing it? We are, I think. Yes, one second. Apologies, just one second. And before that place, thanks, Lay. I think you know all those points were really spot on about any more funding in our uh, fire tech environment. 
Hi, I'm Gilberto Dinsalvo, the CEO of Delphire. I'm here today to tell you about our actual wildfire detection system powered by our sentinel units in the field that can report situational awareness data along with a warning of a fire in seconds. We can also provide a picture for visual confirmation. Today's standard is to detect a giant plume of smoke above the forest canopy. We're focused on protecting critical assets such as the grid or your homes near the wildland interface by detecting ignitions in a matter of seconds and reporting them along with a picture so that we can have an effective and informed response. Our units can detect flame, smoke, heat from our infrared cameras, or we can detect chemical smoke nearby. All these sensors are paired with data communications, an anemometer to tell us the wind direction, ambient sensors to tell us humidity, temperature, pressure, and other critical weather data, along with our cameras providing visual confirmation that's been processed by our onboard AI so that the data is only sent when it's truly needed. For today, we're going to give you a brief demo about how images can be uploaded into our device simulating a fire and showcasing the real time from processing on our device to reporting that data to providing a push notification via a cell phone connection. This is achieved in a matter of seconds and even over satellite we're still able to report a picture in under two minutes. Overall, our system enables a single person to monitor thousands of units in the field. We're currently deploying in four communities in Q1 of 2023, and we're looking for additional pilots for the year. I'd like to thank our team, and as part of today's presentation, I would love to give you a short demonstration about how Delphire's data can integrate with other resources to give an effective firefighting response. Our data is being pulled in real time together with other data sources into the Odin Fire Framework at NASA Ames. You can see data here from infrared satellites, the GOES system, being pulled in every few minutes. We have flights being tracked in real time over the Bay Area to showcase how you might track firefighting resources moving across the landscape. GIS data can be pulled in for the power lines in the area to showcase a resource that Dell Fire is looking to protect. And the fire stations can also be displayed to show where a response to a fire might be coming from in any given area. Wind data can also be shown to showcase where a fire is likely to spread based on current information. Dell Fire's own data is pulled in in real time and can be displayed together with all these other resources to inform an effective and timely response. Our cameras can either report a visible image that uh, showcases the situation nearby. For example, this is an image from a few minutes ago before it got dark, as well as a current image now that it's dark outside. We can also pull up infrared images to showcase the area nearby and any heat spots in the area that you can see has not changed even though it is dark now. We can also upload an image to our device in the field. And once the device in the field analyzes the image, it will send a response to the server almost instantaneously. And if there's a fire detected, that image becomes available for the user along with the smoke and the fire probabilities. As you can see, in just a few seconds, we were able to bring up an alert for the user along with the image and we can trigger an email with a similar picture in under 30 seconds. Even over satellite connections, we're able to deliver this image in under two minutes and inform an effective response along with other information such as temperature, wind speed and wind direction to supplement the NOAA general data in the area, as well as uh, humidity, and pressure as well as volatile organic compounds to smell the fire nearby. We can also provide accelerometer data to see if there's any uh, shaking such as earthquakes happening. So I think this gives you a pretty good overview of how the Dell Fire system can come together with all this other information to help uh, users respond to fires. Thank you.
Great. Terrific. Thank you. All of these are precisely on the number. Okay. Um, next up is Andrew uh, from Pano uh, AI, and uh, uh, then um, we'll go from there. Shall we run that? Trying to load the video right now. Ah, okay. So while we're loading that, um, Lee, I have a question for you. If if how does a company who wants to join your network or a um, corporation who wants to buy one, how do they connect with that network? Is there a is there a website they go to? Um, yeah, there... uh, they can go to firetechconnect.com. Um, I think it's .com.au actually, um, and or they could find me on LinkedIn. And they can um, DM me through through LinkedIn. They won't find me on any other social networks, so there's no point looking. <laughs> um, and or, or you know, um, they can e email me direct, and I'm sure we can share the my email um, my email address uh, through through this forum. Hello everyone, thank you for being part of the Network for Global Innovation session today. My name is Brendan McAtee, I'm the Executive Vice President for Global Resilience and Impact at Mayday.ai mm -hmm. and I'd like to take a few minutes to tell you about the powerful technology that Mayday has brought to bear on wildfire response and management. I'm sorry, I think I might have clicked the Mayday video. <laughs> well, it's all right. Oh, I'm sorry, we'll continue. Apologies. Made to integrate data at scale from satellite to IoT on the ground with an AI fusion engine to deliver natural disaster risk intelligence. Today, we're going to focus on wildfires. This slide shows you why the work Mayday does is so important. Economic losses from natural disasters are reaching into the trillions of dollars, and people and communities are bearing the losses. Our data-driven platform make disaster response cohesive and bring all the technologies needed to optimise response operations together in one feed. Ensures decision makers have all the information they need and importantly, we can shift the needle from a focus on detection and response to resilience with a greater emphasis on preparedness and avoidance, all with the aim of reducing human and economic losses. To make the biggest impact, we know we need to be able to work at scales from global to the individual. The Mayday Scalable Data Infrastructure aids disaster response and situation awareness at any level needed. We collect data globally and we deliver it at organisation individual scale, all to reduce human and economic losses. Our data agnostic AI powered fusion engine ingests data at scales from satellites to cameras and IoT on the ground and integrates two way comms and social media to deliver optimised disaster risk intelligence that can reduce human and economic losses from wildfire. And the design of our early warning multi-hazard platform makes it a powerful, cost-effective, scalable and easily accessible solution for detecting and responding to wildfires. The data-driven power I've talked about is made easy for you to use through a GIS-based disaster control hub, which can be as big or as small as you need for your operations. And importantly, two-way comms are embedded in the hub as well, so you can warn people as needed and receive messages from the field in operational scenarios. As well as real-time operations, we use our AI-driven data fusion engine to develop risk scores for disaster event prediction. This is an example of one of our fire risk products. Mayday delivers this disaster risk intelligence down to the property level through our citizen aware app, with importantly keeping people safe. And we're engaging with the insurance industry through our innovative observation-driven risk modelling approaches to help shift the dial towards community resilience and natural disasters. So we have a highly impactful value offering that has been recognised at the UN level by the Disaster Risk Reduction Agency and the Office for Outer Space Affairs for both its capability and its innovation. 
So Mayday has built an incredible AI-powered data fusion engine to integrate data at scale and deliver disaster risk intelligence that enables greater situation awareness and better decision-making wildfire emergency scenarios. We make these integrated data feeds and comms easily accessible through our GIS-based disaster control hub so that using Mayday's capability, our customers can reduce the human and economic losses from wildfires. So thanks for listening. If you'd like to know more, you can contact me by the details on your screen. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the session. Thank you, Brendan. Sorry, uh, Andrew, you had to wait a little bit. You're, you're going to be up now. Uh, and uh, so here's uh, Pano AI. I hope the, this time you're, we're going to play you. Let me just clarify this and give me just one <laughs> second. Apologies. That's all right. No big deal. While we're uh, waiting, uh, Jessica, we've had a couple of questions from the audience on, of course, they're interested in how to get to, get to those grants <laughs> you know, that you talked oh, about. <laughs> sure, I'll, so, I'll put a yeah. link um, to the overall program and then that has a link to the, the our fire resilience investments span 22 different programs. Um, yeah, many of course. have grants available. So I'll put a link into the kind of the whole overview of the program and, um, Great. and then let people sort of dig in from there. Thanks. Hi, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to present to you all today. My name is Andrew Prolov. I'm the head of Australian go-to-market at Pano AI, and we are the leader in early wildfire detection and intelligence. Now, we empower communities by providing up-to-the-minute information and enhanced coordination capabilities that enable them to detect, confirm, and locate the very first signs of a fire threat. This in turn allows them to make timely and confident decisions in their rapid response to attack fire threats while they're still small. Now, it's important to remember that every catastrophic fire started out as a small fire. With our wildfire intelligence solution, Pano helps first responders get to the scene of the fire while it is still small, thus increasing their chances of containing that fire, but perhaps most importantly, increasing the safety for the first responders on the scene because the fire is still small. Now, at Pano, we're leveraging the most advanced technology available today. Uh, we're taking the latest hardware, software, and artificial intelligence, uh, bringing it together to create an industrial-grade turnkey solution that provides real, actionable wildfire intelligence for our customers. Our hardware includes a network of ultra high definition cameras located atop high vantage points like mountaintops, uh, fire lookout towers, and communication towers. Each one of our pano stations has two cameras, and together they rotate a full 360 degrees every minute to create a clear, unobstructed panorama of the region. And this is also where our name, Pano, comes from. The imagery from our cameras is combined with satellite data and other data feeds, uh, which we ingest into our artificial intelligence system to produce a real-time picture of threats in a geographic region. Now, automated AI detection events are human verified by our 24-7 intelligence center and alerts are sent to customers and first responders containing real-time actionable intelligence. Each of our alerts can be viewed in our simple, uh, yet extremely powerful user interface. And now this is accessible via both mobile and desktop devices. And some of the advanced features included in the Pano interface are incident triangulation, asset proximity, and Zoom to investigate. So what distinguishes Pano is that we provide an end-to-end -end service work extremely closely with customers to, to carefully assess the topography, to understand the communities and assets at risk in the region. And then we optimize a layout of pano stations to ensure coverage of all the high risk zones. We also take responsibility for the deployment of equipment in the field. We ensure the cameras are properly calibrated to the location and we perform thorough end-to-end -end testing with every new pano station deployment. Lastly, our intelligence center also monitors the health of the hardware located in the field, ensuring that our network is operating without any faults so that you can be confident it's working when you need it most. I wanted to share a video of one of our most recent Pano Station deployments. 
located here in Australia, in one of the most beautiful parts of the country, Noosa, Queensland. So this station is located on a lookout called Mount Timbiwa, which is located in Twanton National Park. In the not so far distance, you can see Noosa Village, a world renowned tourist destination. Pano is helping provide wildfire intelligence, or as we like to call it back home, bushfire intelligence in this beautiful wildland urban interface. Here's a video of the Mount Timbiwa Pano station patrolling the Noosa region. The boxes you see show when the AI believes it sees smoke, and they turn green when it's confident that this is a fire, and it creates a detection event. Our intelligence sensor human verifies those detections and alerts our customers, and this all happens within minutes. I'd like to highlight that the AI is able to track several instances of smoke simultaneously, with multiple permit burns occurring here ahead of high fire risk season. Perhaps the most impressive part of this video is that the AI first detected a fire in Tiwa, located 16 kilometers or 10 miles away at 11.15 a.m. Now, this was a full hour before we saw the large vertical plume of smoke go up, which is the first that residents on the ground would have seen that very same fire. The last thing I'd like to do today is to quickly demonstrate an incident which was detected, confirmed, and located on Pano 360. Here we can see the smoke rise from Black Mountain Station. These are the GPS coordinates that we derived from the cross bearings of the two Pano stations that spotted this fire. We can quickly switch views to observe the smoke from a different angle. And here are the compass bearings and the orientation for each station. With our mapping functionality, you can see the location of that smoke start. And we have the ability to quickly zoom in, apply the satellite imagery to understand what residential or other assets are located close to that fire start. Lastly, here is the full 360 degree view shed from the station. And there's the marker showing where the fire is located. Once again, thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you all today. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me directly, andrew at pano.ai. Or you can find out more on our website at www.pano.ai. I look forward to hearing from you soon. Great. Uh, thank you, um, gentlemen, for your uh, presentations. And I want to uh, save the last couple of minutes for, for discussion or questions. I want to, first of all, throw it open to our panelists who, um, and, and Nathan and perhaps Jessica, you could comment, is this the kind of uh, technology you're seeing? Are these the kinds of solutions that are that you're seeing uh, and are interested in? Do you have any questions? Does anything look, God, that looks great, or that's never going to work, or whatever that might be? Because, you know, whether you love them or, or hate them, these companies really could enjoy and can learn from feedback of any kind that you get. And then after that, gentlemen, the companies can ask questions and make comments as well. I'd, I'd just be interested to know how many of you have already talked to Cal Fire, um, you know, because here in California, we have kind of two big players, um, Cal Fire and Cal OES, who would be using sort of fire detection, emergency response um, alert type systems. And, and so I'd just be interested if that's a target audience for you, if you've already sort of engaged with them Good. Uh, or not, or, or even how your technology, how you're seeing sort of California, the space too crowded out here because we're in sort of the world of tech um, and you're you're sort of targeting other countries and other areas um, or or are you know are you guys aiming and targeting uh, California? Uh, well, Roberto, uh, since you're in California, why don't you uh, answer that and then we'll let the rest jump in. Yeah, we're based here in Pasadena, California, and that's definitely uh, a major target for us down the line, although our first uh, two uh, collaborators are probably going to be the utilities and the communities themselves. So we're working directly with communities to get into a community wildfire protection plans and really work from the ground up to provide uh, a customized solution where they need oversight. Uh, I think the collaboration with CAL FIRE will come at the uh, data point and just to follow up on Lay's um, 
introduction to that, understanding how data needs to be distilled and made available is currently taking up a lot of our effort and collaboration. So one place where Cal Fire could really help, I think all of us is coming up with a defined set of standards where different stakeholders within the organization need access to the information. For example, in the utilities, there may be somebody who's an emergency manager who needs access to the alert, which is telling them, hey, you've got a fire near your lines, you need to respond now. Whereas the entire planning department would need access to the three second uh, wind loading for the last hour to know how they need to plan the transmission uh, load on their lines. And similarly, we need more information like that from Cal Fire and from different stakeholders. Um, what about one of the Australian companies, Rob? Yeah, um, so short answer, Jessica, is yeah, we, we've already had some initial conversations. We're doing a couple of implementations here locally in Australia with some of the large firefighting um, uh, associations here. But uh, we are, we, and we're very keen to see how our technology can be taken to the North American market. And, and obviously, CAL FIRE is a, is, a, is a big opportunity for us. So yes, uh, in short, yes, but we're always keen to take that conversation deeper. Uh, Andrew? Hi, yes, I was actually just doing a quick count. So <laughs> we've got 14 stations at the moment uh, across California. Um, we're actually active in five states in the US, so uh, California, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, Colorado. And in uh, in California, so we've got Chief Duncan from St. Helena. Uh, there's also, we've, we've also got fire chiefs from Lake County, Sonoma County, San Mateo, Santa Barbara. So we, we are working closely with the guys. And I think it's one of the most exciting things that we, we've got is to really bring the learnings across countries from uh, US to Australia, Australia to US. And it's also the beauty of we, we really get the, the full year experience as uh, you know, Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere trade-off. But it also means we don't get to sleep much, but it's fine. We enjoy it. Uh, Brendan, do you have any uh, comments you want to make? Yeah, thanks, Brett. Um, yeah, um, from Mayday perspective, we've certainly been tracking some of the big fires that have been going on through uh, California in, in recent times. Uh, and, and one of the strengths of what we're really doing is, is putting that um, information directly into the operational environment. So that two-way communication to and from the, the front line and for impacted communities. Um, so I, we haven't engaged with CAL FIRE too much yet, but that's something we'd definitely like to do. Um, and particularly, I think one of the key bits in that kind of collaboration is, as Lee mentioned, that systems readiness level. Um, so we're working very much in that operational space. So how do these kind of technologies slot into that operational space and so that the systems are ready you know, for response and for action? Um, that's some of our key areas that we're working on at the moment and very much like to progress that with CAL FIRE. Nathan, do you have anything you'd like to uh, chat about? Yeah, I mean, I think similar to what Jessica brought up, I, I would highly recommend connecting with um, the Forest Service. As you can imagine, most of the topography in the state of California, where you would want to put these sort of sensors are on forest system lands. Um, certainly not all of them, but but a, a large number of them would be. And we already have um, communication sites scattered all the way all across the state um, where we have shared facilities with Caltrans, Cal Fire. Um, all of the sort of emergency communication um, sort of towers and facilities, I, I could see a real easy piggyback off of all those um, sort of systems. So if it would help, I could certainly put you in touch with um, some of our permitting folks that you would want to talk to to get those kinds of facilities on your on our existing infrastructure. Yeah, I'll drop my email in the chat. You can send me a send me an email. Yeah. So Thank you. Um, any other any questions comments? Uh, I have. Well, I want to. I want to ask one here for a second. Okay. So, um, I don't know a lot about fire tech, um, but I've spent ten years in clean tech, and one of the, and before that in the world of the internet and software. And one of the things that differentiates clean tech from software in the internet is that it has clean tech needs to get integrated into the infrastructure. It needs to work with utilities and, and uh, transportation uh, infrastructure and to get pilots 
And sometimes it's very hard to figure out how to do that because their technologies are new. Getting out in a tender isn't always the right thing to do because there aren't a lot of things doing the same thing. So I guess, Jessica, what is the right way for these companies to engage? Is it through grants? Is it through tenders? Is it through uh, negotiated pilots? That kind of thing, I guess, is my question. Are all of the above? Yeah, I mean, I think we're having so many different tactics and approaches. I mean, I think sort of an easy sort of first line of approach is to either, um, you know, as, as Gilbert was saying, you know, you work directly with, or, or I think it was Andrew also saying, you work directly with like different Cal Fire chiefs um, and fire chiefs to sort of test and prove your technology. That makes it much easier to sort of go um, out to others and say, hey, we worked with Cal Fire on this. That's a good certification. And then we have an R&D division at Cal Fire um, that is always available to just have conversations and start reviewing technology. I think you guys are already kind of past that point, but um, to that they like to be sort of in in the know on this stuff. And then they start doing the, the procurements if we're going to get something statewide. Um, but also the individual units can have a lot of autonomy to um, to test that out. And then also a lot of the counties that we partner with, um, you know, do a lot of tech innovation um, as well. So, you know, kind of depending on what stage your technology is at, you know, there's different sort of tools available. But I think for you guys, since you're all pretty well developed and underway, you're kind of in the, in the you know, let's get agencies and entities to actually procure and use this um, at scale. You know, that's, that's the conversation with Cal Fire's uh, R&D team. So um, any of you who need that introduction, just let me know. And um, and I'm happy to introduce you to uh, Scott Gregory from Calfire. If if I may, um, would I be able to share my screen quickly just to show some of the things? So what may be of, uh, if I can find the right screen. Uh, hopefully everyone can see that. So, uh, so this is in New South Wales. So we actually deployed our pano station on uh, a fire lookout tower. So this is actually quite a, this is a comms tower. So you can see the microwave dishes and the low end dishes on there. You can see the two pano stations there. Um, and we're actually by the placement of it, we actually eliminate any interference from any of the radio uh, antenna there. Um, but what I did want to show is when working with some of our forestry customers, uh, this is in a station down close to the New South Wales Victorian border. Some of the functionality that we're helping uh, with the, the forest managers, plantation managers, is to overlay uh, information to help them really localize what's going on so that you, we can actually see the plantations, uh, which are right next to uh, some of the state forests and national forests. And then as we actually zoom out, we also are able to introduce the fire agencies and who's responsible there. So th this is all about, Lee mentioned earlier, um, this huge amounts of data. So what we do is we bring it together. We streamline the, the decision and the workflow, which allows uh, the, the data when it's packaged up. It, it's all about intelligence. They know a fire is located in this area with this fire agency responsible close to this particular plantation or national park. Um, and that just enables uh, the, in this case, forestry companies or fire agencies to act very decisively. So hope that helps. Can I can I just add something, Fred? On the on the trials, where where uh, fire tech is at now, I suppose is part of our evolution. Is we're now actively running um, trials, and the four categories, as I mentioned before, is in fire air traffic management. So looking at um, crewed and uncrewed aircraft and managed air space detection prediction. Um, and you know we've got four. We've we've just completed an autonomous systems trial. We've done in conjunction with Telstra and uh, Rymatel. Uh, we're about to embark on a what we call FATM, which is fire air traffic management trials to reduce the um, the minima and help drive the regulation in Australia to an alternative means of compliance in a fire zone, so that we can have crewed and uncrewed aircraft in a reduced airspace. Um, around a, a fire event. Uh, and then early next year, we're looking at running our detection trials. Uh, and then we're also working with agencies here in Australia um, and Data61 CSIRO on our uh, prediction. And in those, in all of those trial activities, and we're looking at other trial activities as well. So 
where fire tech is now is we've now got our facility up and running and now we're just really doubling down and focusing on trials and so we are working with pano uh, we've just had um, their involvement in a trial that we recently did we've just had a mayday involved in a, in a trial that we recently did and we'll continue to look for other companies that we can get involved and typically how we're looking at doing it is bringing some of the corporate private sector like the right Mattels and the Telstras of the world, uh, bringing the agency involved. In this case, it was Queensland Fire and Emergency, and then giving the opportunity for these early stage companies to come in and participate in those um, and having various components of that working together and then getting that integrations working and then proving that sort of systems readiness level. That's really the focus of what our trials are now, and that's what we'll be focused on over the next uh, couple of years, particularly. So, um Thank you, Lee. Uh, I think we're getting close to, we're over our time allotment, but I, I have a, one more final question for uh, either Jessica and or Nathan. And my, I guess it's what we're seeing from these companies is a focus on um, detection, uh, uh, forecasting, planning, and the front, what I would, as a layman call, is the front end. Is that is that where the sweet spot of technology is it should be? Is is that where the biggest upside is, or is it on the other side where Nathan was talking about, you know, biodigesters of of, of wood products uh, and so forth? That's my question. <laughs> You know, I don't think that there is a sweet spot, right? It's, okay. it's sort of like I was saying on fire okay. resilience. It's like you need all of okay. the above, right? We have to get yeah. this whole system to function again, right? The, the whole ecology around fire um, has been just completely thrown off, right? From, oh. from a capacity where nature could suddenly correct itself. And so we have to then adapt how institutions are functioning, how communities are functioning mm -hmm. to be able to then get to a point where we can live with fire. And so that's going to require innovation at every level, right? We're innovating how we're okay. doing bureaucracy, right? We changed okay. California's environmental processes from taking two years down to uh, four weeks. And and that I mean that was not a wave of magic wand and just get it done. It was a lot of bureaucratic painfulness to right to be creative on that front. But on in terms of technology, you need all of the above, right? You don't just need sort of that more precise detection, suppression, and analytics. Like that's why we're investing at every level, right? Our that that wildfire resilience program, I put the link in the chat too. Um, you know, that's our that's our two point eight billion dollar investment, and that bands, right? We put in $25 million just for remote sensing data acquisition um, and monitoring systems, $10 million just to be able to develop better, better data analytics tools called the Forest Data Hub. Um, and uh, in addition to sort of funding just for research and analytics, um, additional $50 million for uh, that climate catalyst to get new technology on the ground to do some of this wood consumption and wood utilization work. Um, so, you know, kind of every level we're we're making investments here. And so I think the question is like, you can't just wave a wand and say technology will solve this, right? There's a lot of manual labor that has to go in. We have to do by hand what fire should have done for a hundred years, right? So you can't replace even with like airplanes or drones, the firefighters on the ground with shovels, because anything you're dropping on a fire is just slowing it down. It doesn't put it out. Um, and and so it's guys on the ground who actually put out the fire. Um, and and you don't have like great technology solutions. It's same with like the, the resilience work that you're doing. You have to do a lot of that sort of fuel reduction by hand. You can have technology, you know, the ma manufacturing technology that helps with like, you know, better masticators or better machinery um, to help um, improve what would other be manual labor, but when you're trying to do work on like, you know, 60 degree slopes, uh, it's hand crews that you're going to rely on. It's really hard <laughs> to get the technology that has, the, I mean, there, it does exist, but like, yeah. you know, or sometimes people will do logging with helicopters, but I mean, it's, you know, that's really sort of exact work. And so this spatial analytics, right, it has uses for both us on the planning side when we're trying to better precisely anticipate where we're going to do that work and to get multiple ecological benefits out of it, right? I don't want to put a fuel break in and just have it help on fire resilience. I want it to also improve biodiversity, carbon storage, watershed health, 
because that's how you know when you're getting that right, that you'll actually have then a sustainable state for fire as well. And so like you want the technology to be able to be in place to tell you what's the ecology there, what's the biodiversity there, what's the future climate modeling so that you're not only putting your fuel break in the right spot, but also then maximizing the additional ecological um, benefits that we need to be able to hit. So there's just, I, I think there's a lot of room for technology solutions to enhance sort of physical solutions um, and, and meet in the middle there. So I don't, I don't think there's a one size fits all here because it's such a complex shift um, it needs a complex solution and, uh, and just grateful for all the thought leaders who are on here today who are uh, working to solve it. Well, Jessica, I think that's going to uh, be the last word uh, on our get together. Uh, we're not only out of time, we're over time. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, our panel. Steve, thank you for moderating this thing and making it happen. Jessica, of course, and, and, and Nathan and Lee. I know this takes it's a lot of time, not just sitting here and doing it, but preparing it. We really appreciate it. The companies, I hope you've gotten something out of this. We really appreciate you putting those videos together. Uh, for those of you who, you know, we video uh, this, we record this session, and then we put it up on, on various parts of our, our, whether it's YouTube or, or LinkedIn or our uh, engine website so there's a way of going to and, and playing through the whole thing so if there's contacts you want to make or so forth that's a, a good way of doing it uh, for those of you out there if you want to ask questions my my email is fred at uh, engine.org engine has a uh, wide variety of social media things that you can contact us with as well i want to thank you very very much i really found it uh, fascinating i'm more encouraged that you know we can actually uh uh, make something happen and, and, and reduce this chaos that's happening all around us. Okay, thank you. Thanks.